Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about ecology. Topic for the day is going to be evolution and biodiversity. So as always, let me get you some objectives, and we'll get going. By the end of this video, two things that I need you to know or be able to do. First up is to explain the importance of biodiversity, and second is to discuss the relationship between evolution and biodiversity. So. Throughout the course, we will talk a lot about biodiversity and the importance of biodiversity and why we care about it. Um, and I'll get in a little bit more into that in the uh, later parts of this video. But before we get there, I want to talk about types of biodiversity. I'm pretty sure this is something I had mentioned in a previous video, but I want to review it real quick. Biodiversity exists on three different levels. The first one is the genetic level. And the genetic level is just all of the genetic material that is present in a population. The greater the genetic variation, the greater the, vari the uh, biodiversity. The less the genetic variation, the less the biodiversity. And genetic variation is going to drive our other two levels of biodiversity. So from genetic variation, you move to species biodiversity. At species biodiversity level, you're talking about all of the different types of species that live in an area. When I use the term species, I mean animals that are living in the same place at the same time and can reproduce with one another to produce fertile offspring. And final level of biodiversity is ecosystem biodiversity, and that's talking about all of the different ecosystems that there are around the world. So why is biodiversity important? And basically, biodiversity is important because it provides ecosystem resilience, which is a topic I've talked a little bit about. If you remember, resilience is the ability for or of an ecosystem to come back after a disturbance. The greater the variety of organisms in an area, the greater the resilience of that ecosystem. Because if you think about it, a disease might come through and kill off like all of three or four organism, three or four types of organisms. If that ecosystem only has three or four different types of organisms, then your ecosystem is shot. And there's not going to be anything to come back. But if your ecosystem has got you know 30 or 40 different types of organisms living in the area, losing three or four while isn't a good thing your ecosystem should be able to keep going forward. So having greater biodiversity ensures that a ecosystem can keep going from year to year and season to season. Also, as we are talking about species, um, when we talk about two terms, or we use two terms, and we talk about species richness and species evenness. If an area is said to be species rich or has species richness. That means that there are a lot of different types of animals living in an area. There are a bunch of species in a given area. Um, New York City is a very diverse city. There are tons of different nationalities in that area so that you could so you could say that New York City is a very species rich environment in that there are a lot of different types of humans and animals. If an area is said to be even, this means that all of the different animals are evenly distributed from one another. If you look at my little diagram here, say that each colored dot represents a specific species. This picture up here shows that it is species rich and that you see a ton of different colors. And it is species even because none of the colors are clumped together. They're all spread out all over the place. This diagram down here, is not very rich because you see it's only got a couple of different colors, lots of greens, a little purple, a little red, and it is not even because you can see all of the greens are clumped together. So this ecosystem up here is species rich and species even. This one down here is species not rich or it lacks species richness. It also lacks evenness. Now know that a ecosystem can be rich without being even, and it can be even without being rich. Okay, this is going to be the rest of the video. I'm going to be talking about ways that evolution drives biodiversity, and this is basically going to be one chapter in a video, so hopefully we can keep it short. A couple terms that you need to know. Genotype. Genotype is the genetic material that is present in an organism. So all of your genes that make you you is your genotype. Genotype drives phenotype. Phenotype is the actual appearance or the manifestation of those genes. So if I've got genes that say that Vance Kite should have a big nose, my phenotype will be the big nose. So genotype drives phenotype. Now, evolution is basically one species splitting into two species. 
that's an event called speciation, which speciation is the creation of new species. Um, evolution acting on a group of individuals causes one group of div individuals to divide into two groups of individuals. We have just created biodiversity. So as one organism evolves into two different groups of organisms, or I guess it'd be better to say as one group of organisms speciates into two groups of organisms, we now have got double the biodiversity that we once had. So as new genotypes come along, those new gene combinations are going to affect the phenotype, which is going to be the appearance and the function of animals. And as we get new and novel phenotypes, then we have got new species and our biodiversity has increased. In the rest of the video, we're going to talk about mechanisms that drive speciation. So first one is artificial selection versus natural selection. Artificial selection is pretty easy. Most of you can recognize this right off the bat. This is humans breeding together animals or plants for a desired trait. The reason that we have got all the different types of dogs that we have is that people have said, oh, I would like a dog that has nice thick fur and is able to run well and hangs out in the snow, does a good job in the snow. So they start breeding animals together that have those traits until you get a Siberian Husky or a Malamute or something like that. Um, another group of people might say, oh, I want a dog that is really good at going down small holes, likes to chase little critters, um, and is very loyal. <clears throat> they do some breeding with dogs that have those characteristics and eventually you get a dachshund. So in the case of dogs, biodiversity has been driven by people artificially selecting for traits that they want. And you know, this is where we've got a, got a lot of our crops and animals and things like that. Natural selection is nature working on animals and basically determining which ones live or die. You have heard the term survival of the fittest, I'm sure. In this case, using that term fittest or fitness refers to the ability of an animal to reproduce and have its genes go from one generation to the next. So over time, as environments changed, animals have basically adapted to that change by either living and passing on their good genes or dying and taking their bad genes out of the gene pool with them. So artificial selection, humans are selecting for a trait, natural selection, nature changes, and animals either live or die in response to that change. With this idea of natural selection, you need to know about genetic drift. And genetic drift is a random change in a population. So here's a quick example for you. We got a population of frogs. And up here in the original population, we've got light green frogs, we got dark green frogs, and we have got brown frogs. This is our original population. Now, let's say that there is some sort of disease that comes through and it wipes out all the brown frogs. As the next generation of frogs is created, this next generation is only going to have light green frogs and bright green frogs or dark green frogs because all these brown frogs have died. They cannot pass their genes on to the next generation. Genetic drift is a random change in the genetic composition of a population. So the brown frogs randomly died or were attacked by a disease, which means that their genes have been taken out of the gene pool. <clears throat> Another mechanism of evolution you need to be aware of is the bottleneck effect. <clears throat> Excuse me. Bottleneck effect is a situation where a large group of organisms is basically whittled down to a small group of organisms and that affects your gene pool. So if you look at that top picture there, you've got a gene pool that's got lots of different pigs in it. There are a bunch of different gene combinations, but for some reason, a large population or a large section of that population of pigs dies off. So only the remainders are able to pass their genes on to the next generation. Um, we have seen this in cheetah populations in Africa. Once upon a time, there were tons and tons and tons of cheetahs in very healthy populations across Africa. But sometime in history, and we don't know what it was, um, the population of cheetahs got knocked down significantly. Their gene pool got cut down quite a bit. So the cheetahs that are now in existence in Africa are not as healthy as they could be because a lot of the good genes were knocked out of the original population. And so the ones that are left have got some genes that make them prone to disease, but because the gene pool is very small, they keep passing those genes around within that pool. So bottleneck effect is going from a huge gene pool down to a small gene pool. Something kind of like it is the founder effect. And this is the basic idea that if to 
people or organisms move to an isolated area and populate that area, the gene pool is going to be small because the gene pool only results from the genetic material that was present in the two people or animals that ended up in that area. So if you've got a bird migrating across the ocean, it gets blown off course and lands on an island. If it's able to mate with another bird that's in the area, then whatever their gene combination is will determine the population of birds living on that island. Um, populations that result from the founder effect usually have low genetic diversity because the gene pool has just resulted from those two original organizations, not organizations, organisms. As animals speciate and kind of adapt to environments, <clears throat> they start to take on a niche. And a niche is basically an organism's function within an environment. It's the things that they do, it's the food that they eat, the other species that they interact with, the things that they prey upon. Their role in the environment is a niche. And there's basically two types of niche. You've got a fundamental niche and a realized niche. A fundamental niche is all of the things that an organism could do in an environment. It's all of the foods it could possibly eat, all of the places it could possibly live, um, all of the competition it could possibly have. But obviously, in reality, or niches, organisms' niches are going to overlap. So there's going to be competition that's going to happen. There is going to be shortage of resources. There is going to be shortage of homes and food. So that leads an organism to its realized niche. The realized niche is basically what it actually does in, in an environment. And every organism's realized niche is going to be much smaller than its fundamental niche because it could do a ton of things, but because of competition and uh, resource shortage, it's only able to do a few small things. And so you also have niche generalists and specialists. A niche generalist is an organism that does a bunch of different things. They eat lots of different types of food. They can sleep in lots of different areas. They can handle a bunch of different environments. They are very, uh, I guess, adaptable. A niche specialist is an organism that can only really handle a very small niche and if that small niche is damaged then that organism can't survive anymore. An example of a specialist is the fungus you see sticking out of the head of that ant right there. It's known as a cordyceps fungus. There are thousands of types of them but each one is specific to one type of insect and it can only live within that one type of insect so it is specialized for that insect. In general, um, niche generalists are going to be much more resistant to damage to an ecosystem than a specialist and that makes sense if you think about it for a little bit. All right, this is going to be our last slide for the day. So mass extinctions are times where a large proportion of the species on earth start to disappear at one time. Now throughout history the fossil record shows us that there have been five major mass extinctions um, from things like ice ages, uh, meteor strikes, things like that. Um, now, the interesting thing is scientists are pretty sure that we are currently in the middle of the sixth mass extinction, or the sixth great extinction, because as they look around, they see that um, species are going extinct very, very rapidly, much more rapidly than we have ever known in history to this point. Now, the first five major extinctions on Earth were driven by natural things, whether it was, like I said, a meteor or an ice age or a change in climatic conditions. It was the Earth doing its thing, and it wiped out a bunch of animals. Scientists are pretty sure that this sixth mass extinction is the result of human activity, probably mostly habitat loss. As humans expand and build, we take out habitats, and as we take out habitats, then animals lose their niches and their homes and you know their resources, and they in turn go extinct. So the sixth mass extinction is probably being driven by human activity. So that's it. Hopefully by the end of this video, or hopefully right now, you've got a little better sense of the ways that evolution drives biodiversity. If you need to rewind, take a look at some of those mechanisms. Until then, thanks for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.